Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and with me on the show today, I have my special guest, Gautam. Gautam, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Tom. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and great to be on the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast. Yes. So about myself, I am Gautam Jain. I belong to the city or uh, country of India. And basically, when I was in college, I got the I was lucky enough to get into the best college of the country, which is IIT Delhi. And I graduated in computer science from there. So while in college, I met my co-founders, Titrash, Mehul and Ayush. And we always had that dream, you know, at that time during our college, like Flipkart, housing.com were the big startup poster boys in the country and they were making all the news and <laughs> we were inspired by them. You're like, why can't we make our company, which will also go big. So we start in third year of college, we started Plat, which was a broker to broker marketplace, uh, which was a re in real estate domain. So by the time we had graduated, housing.com which was one of the large companies that time, they gave us, gave us an acquisition offer and we decided to join forces with them. Nice. So we, we worked in housing.com for one year and then we at that time we left housing.com and we were running a small side business. In that small side business, we were buying goods from China and selling them in the US. So buying on uh, Alibaba.com, selling on Amazon.com, we realized that it was not the buying and selling, but actually the transfer of goods from China to US, which took most of our time, most of our energy and a lot of our costs, right? So we reached out to freight forwarders websites. We found out what they are giving and we found there's a lot of discrepancy in prices. We found that like once the shipment was underway, we couldn't, we could only track the milestone level data. We could not track where our like hundred thousand dollar worth of shipment is. While we could track our food via Swiggy and like cabs via Uber, which is only a few dollars worth, right? We can track them in real time. <laughs> so we got introduced to the space. Being from technology background, we thought, can we do something in the international logistics space? So we quit housing. I interned in a freight forwarding company for six months to learn about the industry. And then we decided to start CoComet. So we started GoComet and now we are about seven years into the making. And I would say that now, like fast forward seven years, we have customers like Unilever, customers like Coach Industries, Sony, Honda, Accentra, like John Deere, Motul, who use our platform and they manage their entire international logistics through, through GoComet platform. Nice. And just, you know, to set a bit of a, a context for people, what is it that these customers you have are managing when they're using your platform? Sure. So at GoComet, we say we are the world's number one easiest to use supply chain visibility platform, right? So number one easiest to use is not said by us, but by industry peers and uh, like the software websites. We, in the supply chain visibility is what we provide through the entire processes of logistics. So when the company's logistics department, they think that, okay, I'm planning to do a shipment next month or uh, next quarter or next year. At that time, starting from that till they have procured the freights, they have tracked their shipments, they have uh, like the documents managed through stakeholders, document coordination, and then the invoices, like when the invoices come from freight forwarders, they have to be audited and they have to be paid and the, and the reporting has to happen. So during the entire process is what we have like four major products and four market intelligence products. So that's what companies use us for. Okay. And what are the, what functionality do these products give your customers that, you know, make you the number one <laughs> platform? Sure. Uh, thanks, Tom. So the main the main benefit that the customers get is, for example, a big challenge which companies faced before coming to GoComet was like they are doing 500 shipments or like 5000 shipments every month via 15 different carriers and 10 different freight forwarders. Now, these carriers, when they have to know where the shipments are, these carriers and freight forwarders would all give results in different formats. Many carriers would just ask them to come on the website and track their shipments. So GoComet gives them a single window where they don't have to track. We have the backend integrations. They just share which of their shipments are uh, they have booked 
and rest everything we do. We automatically track the shipments instead of like they having to track 500 shipments 10 times each shipment during the month, like 5,000 times. Instead of that, they just put it once on GoCovid and we give single window platform to easily know the which of the 515 shipments are delayed, which I need to focus on. As a VP of logistics, I can do exception management and planning by exception rather than uh, letting my customers tell me which shipments are delayed for them. Okay, nice, nice. And obviously, well, this is the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast. So how are you helping customers with their sustainability goals? Great. So sustainability is a big, important part of GoComet and how we are helping companies do it. So before I go into how GoComet does it, let me share what companies are doing until now. So that's okay. what we have seen. Now, the good thing is that the company's logistics department, because many of the customers that we have are the customers who are like publicly listed and either SEC has asked them or the governments as per Paris Agreement have asked them to make goals according to like they have to be carbon neutral by 2040 or 2050 and many have many have uh, like self-committed goals as well. Now, the good thing is that the logistics departments also have targets that they have to know, they have to present that how much they are meeting their logistics, uh, their sustainability targets and how much carbon emission they are doing because ocean shipping and air shipping, both are world's like very large part of carbon emissions and they are like very notorious in that in, in the ocean shipping and the air shipping, right? Yeah. So they, so the current state is that logistics companies, one of the companies I was, uh, I uh, like we were, we were, we were working with, they were calculating and estimating their carbon emission spend by taking the annual freight spend last year. Wow. Right. So it's like actually, it was that rough an estimate. It's like actually trying to lose weight by taking your annual spend on food last year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so right. Uh, that's the current state. Companies don't know. They have only high level estimates. Even if they ask their carriers and freight forwarders, they give a lot of unaudited data and in different formats because everyone has their own format. Mm -hmm. Right. So companies cannot accurately track how much carbon emissions they are doing, what actions they can take to reduce the carbon emission. At GoComet, we have the tools starting from planning and when the shipment is executed to tell the customers and share exactly because we are accredited. We are partner loan is accredited by GLEC and we share the carbon emissions based on the latest carbon emission factors of the vessels that will be used to uh, do the shipments, which will add up and share with them that, okay, if they do shipment via the ca one carrier, that how much emissions it will be, if they do by a second, how much it will be, it also calculates annually how much they have spent on it. So we are seeing that trend where just like companies have a cost budget, they also will have, are starting to ha have a CO2 budget that how much carbon emissions budget they can spend on each shipment so that they and we enable them to choose the shipments carrier according to that budget. Okay, nice. So taking a step back on this, how are you calculating those carbon emissions? Sure. So the carbon emissions are calculated because we know we are tracking the shipments. We know where it originated from, where it will go, where it is going to go. So we know the exact distance, exact route. We also know the vessels it will take and how many trust shipments does, are going to be there. We know that. So by the vessel, we know how, what is the carbon emission factor for that vessel, which, okay. which is based on the fuel type it is using, how large the vessel is, what type of engine they have, which uh, leads to a factor of like per kilometer per ton of cargo, what will be the carbon emissions for this kind of vessel. So you multiply that by the, uh, the weight in the container and the distance that is traveling will give the carbon emissions for that journey. Okay. Does the speed of the vessel come into account as well? Oh, not, uh, not a lot actually, because I, I don't think that comes into picture a lot. Okay. Okay. Because I, I had read somewhere that the carriers are modifying the speed of their vessels, reducing the speed of their vessels to reduce the fuel consumption, which of course would be a proxy for the carbon emissions. 
you are right you are right so all of that factors actually come into the annual carbon emission factor that comes in and accredited by GLEC because that gets calculated yearly based on what the how the vessel performed last year you also have to see uh, what is the age of vessel because the engines have aged by one more year every year so you calculate based on that uh, whether the maintenance was done properly or not secondly you see a lot of congestions these days tom right yeah. so when you see a lot of congestions the engines have to be on they are on and the ship is waiting which means it's consuming fuel although it's not covering any distance so all those factors come in, come in like uh, and right now the seas in, in the seas canal red sea there is a disruption and we are seeing a lot of vessels in because we are tracking more than a million shipments, like 1.2 million shipments every year. So we know how many ships are there in the sea, how many are waiting, how many are just anchored there to be communicated what are the next steps for them. So that increases the fuel consumption, the uncertainties in the supply chain. Okay. And the, the disruption in the Red Sea, is that is that because of the uh, Houthi rebels out of Yemen attacking ships? That's right. So it's 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 because of the rebels attacking the ships. It's because the the tensions are escalating with with Israel, with Egypt. So you know, so uh, the geopolitical scenario there is very tough actually for any large company because they are risking their entire vessels, which are worth like mil- billions of dollars and billions of dollars worth of cargo on top of them. The the alternate route is that they have to go via like the Cape of Good Hope uh, mm. in South Africa. So that's that's there. In fact, you know, so this is a very surprising news uh, is that like in 1967, when the Israel and Egypt were at war, so they Egypt closed the Suez Canal for eight years. Right. And, you know, there were no shipments happening at that time through Suez Canal for eight long years. And it can be a very big challenge for the industry if the geopolitical scenario goes in that direction. Uh, let's hope not. But this is one of the big things which can uh, pressurize the countries to do something which they don't want to do. Yeah, and both canals are in trouble at the moment because the Panama Canal is suffering from drought. So the levels of the Panama Canal are low. It, a lot of people might might not be aware, but the Panama Canal is f- is fed from freshwater lakes. So the, the levels of it are, are based on actual rainfall. It's not it's not as maritime as you might think. And so the, the the Panama Canal is in trouble because of droughts. So the amount of vessels going through are reduced, or the size of vessels going through are reduced. And now the Suez Canal is also in trouble. And this could have big implications for the mileage, to your point, that vessels have to do if they have to go around the Cape of Good Hope, around the, the bottom of South Africa, and or around the, so, the southern tip of South America. You know, that would add... That would add time to shipments, but it would also add to the amount of fuel they're using and therefore the increased carbon emissions. So, yeah, let, let's hope this is resolved quickly enough. I agree. I agree. It adds thousands of kilometers to the journey, which can be done easier. So it can be done easier and can can be done faster as well, in lesser cost as well. So if I'm a logistics manager using your platform, Gautam, I can, at the moment choose my carrier based on their reliability and based on their pricing, but I'll also be able to do it based on their carbon footprint. Thanks, Tom. So if you are a logistics manager and if you're not using GoComet, then even the reliability index is something that you will not have for the carriers. Let let me show what I mean by that. So the as uh, okay so as you can see the <clears throat> so on our platform we have built uh, this is the sailing schedules where you can actually see the sailing schedules of all different carriers you can see what is the transit time you can see what is the departure date arrival date how many trans shipments it's going to go through and what are the routes it will it is going to take now this data me, is available let me hold you a second there, Gotham, because just for people who are listening to this, Gotham is just showing sharing a screen here. So be aware, Gotham, not everyone is, is watching this on YouTube. And for people listening, there is a YouTube version of this, which is linked to in the comments, and you can check it out afterwards. Sorry, proceed. Go ahead, Gotham. Thank you, Tom. So this data of the various carriers like MSC, CMSC, GM, Hapag, Lloyd, Hyundai, 
is available on the websites which carriers publish. However, since we are tracking so many shipments, we know what is the reliability of the a particular carrier on a particular route. This route we are talking about. Let's say let's take an example: Shanghai to Los Angeles. So the data currently share, shares that the reliability of carriers is calculated based on the number of on-time arrivals. So this particular carrier has only 32% arrivals on time, which means that like 68% of the time your shipments will not arrive when they were supposed to. And the average deviation is five days. The average ETA changes is one time. So you can see that which are the most reliable and the uh, most uh, unreliable carriers on a particular route for actually taking the decision that these are the these are the vessels and the shipments I want to do take for this route. Also, is there the price? Because the price is a one factor. Reliability is one factor. Price is a second factor. And the third factor is sustainability. So the, in the price factor, you can see that what are the price ranges and how it has changed over time. This is the industry benchmark. We take the top 10 prices submitted on a particular route or a particular country. And those are shared here as an index, which we call GoComex rate index to help you see that whether your prices are lower or higher than that price, right? Okay. So the very easy to, to check that it's like we have made it available for free. Uh, you go to gocomet.com and on market intelligence tab, you can see the smart schedules to see the pricing and to see the schedules, right? The third factor which comes is the sustainability. We are building, we are integrating our sustainability tool with the sailing schedules, smart schedules, where companies can see that which carrier has lower and higher emissions. Now, using this data, you can see that some carriers have like up to 80% more emissions, like up, you can save up to 80% more in carbon emissions if you are choosing one carrier over the other. You would also want to know, so using the three factors of like reliability, carbon emissions and the price, you can choose that which is the best suited for your shipment uh, for your customer. Okay. And just on this, this one particular route, you're saying that there are some people who have a CO2 emissions of less than a half a ton and others who are above three and a, well, 3.45 tons is, is the highest I see there. Correct. That's correct. The only from this available data, there might be more carriers. Yes. Wow. I mean, that's an enormous difference. Three, three and a half tons down to less than half a ton. That's right. And probably the reason for this is because there are two transshipments in that data. So in that carrier, so in that right. road. So when you're using via that road, like it has to go to one place, it then it goes like get transferred to another vessel, transferred to a third vessel and uh, also adds up in the transit time, which you can see in the schedule section. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fascinating. And so have you seen a lot of demand for this functionality within your product from your customers? Oh, yes, absolutely. So actually, we have customers like Ecentra, customers like Motul who have adopted this already. And they are using this to budget for how much they can spend on carbon emissions for a particular month. So our platform uses AI to actually calculate how much you have spent and to predict that how much with the current rate, if you don't change anything, how much you're going to be spend, spending towards end of the year. So they can see that whether they want to make any changes there. And would they have historic data available to them? So would they be able to say, well, two years ago for this amount of shipments, my carbon footprint was this, but this year it's this much less or this much higher? You are correct. You are correct. So this much less or higher depends on how much data when a company starts using. So all the data on GoCorbett, they can actually check and see the trends from this, when they started using the platform, there are customers who has been using, who have been using GoComet for more than seven years. So for them, all that data will be available to see that, okay, I was spending this much. Now I'm spending this much in carbon emissions, right? And this is my target, whether I met my targets every year or not. Okay. Wow. And so I can see then 
with, I mean, we're, we're shortly after COP28 and now fossil fuels are, we're, we're, we're saying we're transitioning away from fossil fuels and fossil fuels are what are powering most of these vessels, if not all of these vessels still. So the, the logistics companies have got to be sitting up, taking notice of this and saying to themselves, okay, I need to get my emissions down. This is one of the few platforms available to them to allow them, you know, choose their shipments based on their carbon footprint, amongst other factors, correct? That's correct, Tom. That's correct. The biggest challenge that we see on ground, now it's different from a challenge which is top down. So top down, the goals are set. However, we need to give the decision-making authority and power to the one person who is making that decision that which carrier or which route will this shipment go on. So mm -hmm. until that person has the visibility, they cannot make a better decision. And the estimate will be back to the same thing that annual cost spend will then be used to see how much carbon emissions we did, which is a very, very vague estimate and cannot tell whether we are going towards a better and greener supply chain. Yeah, yeah. If the logistics managers are cognizant of this and start using this platform in this way to get their emissions down, that's going to put massive pressure on the shipping companies to change out their ships, make them more sustainable, or be prepared to lose a lot of business. I agree, Tom. And that is the reason why... The Paris Agreement is there so that everyone who is actually like it's it's a it should there should be a pressure on everyone who is on the planet to become more sustainable and become more carbon neutral. And I think when more carrier data gets available, like what how much exact emissions will be there, then along with cost, it will become a factor. And over time, we will see companies spending more in R and D. Just like the automobile companies are now spending from the last few years, they are spending more in electric engine, electric motor, yeah. R&D, and we are getting better results than, uh, than the diesel and uh, than the gasoline engines, right? So that's how we imagine the world will go into where, uh, like, let's hope we will see a major, majority acceptance of electric motors even in the worldwide shipping. So yeah. that's, that's what we hope for. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, no, this, this is, this is really interesting. Are the shippers, are the, sh are the shippers, are the likes of the, the Marks and the Hapag Lloyds and et cetera, are they seeing a shift towards more sustainable transportation in the demand from their customers as a, as a consequence of these kind of things? Oh, yes, absolutely. For example, one big event and transition happened towards sustainable uh, movement was the low sulfur uh, surcharge, which mm -hmm. was implemented by these carriers, uh, by the carriers around 2019, 2020, when a regulation came that you cannot have more than 0.1% sulfur content in your fuel. So the companies had to spend more like Musk and like the shipping lines had to spend more on probably cleaning the fuel or probably like reducing its like treating it to reduce its sulfur content so that the con uh, so that it becomes accepted under the new norms so they passed that cost and it was like very big thing at a time to to the to for the shippers because their cost increased by like 100 or 150 dollars per shipment and that was at that time about like 10 percent increase in the freight costs because of low sulfur sulfur surcharge so definitely that change is happening and now we don't see that for the sulfur, now we are seeing that's the same thing for carbon. And th that will definitely shift them to more sustainable methods of shipping and more sustainable engines and more sustainable vessels. Okay, fascinating. And if you're tracking all this, I can imagine that you should be able to start producing some very interesting data on the global reductions in maritime emissions in the coming, you know, well, even starting from 2020, if you've been tracking it even before that, you, you said seven years. So that's back to 2016. So you should be able to produce some fascinating data on the last seven years and the next, you know, however many years on, on the, the reduction in emissions from a maritime ship. Is it? No, it's not just maritime, though, either, because you mentioned at the start 
that you're doing air freight as well, correct? That's correct. So both of those, it's it's even harder still, I suspect, to get emissions down in air freight, though. You are right. It's uh, it's harder to get emissions down in air freight. However, you would be surprised, Tom, that ocean shipping contributes more towards greenhouse gas emissions than air shipping globally combined. Is that just because of the amount of it that's done? That's right. It's due to the amount of it is. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's right. Because 90% of cargo actually moves via ocean shipping and only 10% of shipments cargo move via air. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. Gautam, we're coming towards the end of the podcast now. Is there any question I haven't asked that you wish I had or any aspect of this we haven't touched on that you think it's important for people to be aware of? So I think um, one important thing that I want to be sharing is that like green carrier evaluation and route optimizations is something which a lot of companies can work towards. And in fact, according to a recent McKinsey study, they estimate that 50% of the carbon emission goals that the companies have can be achieved just by switching to better routes or better suppliers of cargo only if they had this information. So I want to leave with the, this thought that if we do better tracking and give it in the hands of the people who are actually making the decision, we can reduce 50%, up to 50% of carbon emissions that we that, that are currently happening and like achieve our goals faster. Brilliant. Brilliant. Gautam, that's been fascinating. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. If people, by the way, if people would like to know more about yourself or any of the things we talked about, where would you have me direct them? Sure. So if they want to reach to me personally, they can reach on my LinkedIn account. It's Gautam Frame Chen, and I, I, I come right there at the top. If they want to know more about our company and uh, want to explore the platforms, they are, ha- they are like welcome to visit our website which is www.gocomet.com, G-O-C-O-M-E-T.com. And where did the name Go Comet come from? Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, my co-founder, Chitrash, was actually reading a book called Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And mm-hmm. in that, the fastest freight train is actually called Comet. So we decided to name our company Comet based on that. And then we got the domain. We, we thought that if we just keep Comet, then we will not come on the first in SEO ranking. So we added like go to it. So it, it became go Comet. Okay. Okay. Great. That's, br- that's been brilliant, Gautam. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Thank you, Tom. It was a pleasure talking to you.